be sharing God's word with us this morning. This morning we're continuing in our series in the book of Galatians in the New Testament, chapter 2. We've been hearing the teaching uh, the past few weeks, uh, these first couple of chapters in Galatians. And now in chapter 2, verses 11 through 14. So we're going to have the text up on the screen here in a minute for all of us uh, as I read it. But first I want to give a little uh, reminder for where we are, what's happening at this point in time. Because this is a tale of two visits. We saw in the earlier part of this chapter that Paul and Barnabas and Titus visited Jerusalem. They met with James and Cephas. Now that is Peter's here on May And they also met with John. And in that time, they shook hands together in agreement over something very particular. And that agreement was they saw God is pouring out His Spirit on all people, on Jewish Christians, on Gentile Christians. And they agreed we no longer have to be circumcised in order to receive salvation from Jesus. This was part of the Mosaic Law in the Old Testament, connected to uh, purification laws in order to be cleansed, in order to come into God's presence. And they all agree, only Jesus cleanses us. It's only by Jesus that we receive salvation because of the work that he's done. And dying on the cross and coming back to life so that we can have a turn to God and be connected with him because of his love for us because he's come to be with us. And so we agree, some of us will go minister to those circumcised. Some of us will go minister to those uncircumcised. They shook hands in agreement. That was the first visit. Today we're going to look at the second visit, where we see Peter, said here, see this in our text, Peter is an Antioch. And Paul goes to Peter and says that he opposes him. This is what the controversy is in the second visit. So we're going to see why is he opposing him in just a minute. But first, follow along with me. If you have the Bible, please pull it out. Um, I'll also have it here on the, on the screen. Here's what's happening in the second visit. But when Cephas came to Antioch, now this is Peter. When Cephas came to Antioch, I, meaning Paul, opposed him to his face. Because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw I, this is Paul, when I saw that your conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to see this before them all, if you know a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force Gentiles to live like Jews? So this is our text this morning. And before we move on, I want to give us a little more context, but first I want us to see the main point here. Which is why Paul is opposing Peter. And we see that in verse 11. Again, it says, When Cephas came to Antioch, Paul said he opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. And we see the reason for this, the main point of what's happening here is in verse 14. He said, When I saw that their conduct was not instead of the truth of the gospel. I said to see this before them all, if you know a Jew, live like a Gentile, not like a Jew. How can you force Gentiles to live like a Jew? He's saying I opposed them because they were not in step with the truth of the gospel. He was saying we once had this agreement, but now you're, you're changing your mind. You're acting hypocritically. So he said I opposed him to his face because this was a compromise of the essential truth of the gospel. The good news of Jesus, the future of the church, was at stake in this moment. That is why he was opposing them. So another piece of context that we need to be reminded about is who was the circumcision group? Who was the circumcision group? They're a pressure group following them around, harassing them. 
saying, yes, we believe that you need to believe in Jesus in order to receive salvation, but we also believe that you have to follow the Mosaic Law. We believe that you have to follow it in order to be accepted by God. So this pressure group is coming around, and they were causing this impact that we're seeing in this change of course with Peter and with Moses and with so many others. Okay, so you got some contacts. You've been reminded about the tale of two visits. <laughs> and as you've heard about what's happening in this scene, I have a question. I'm wondering about the thoughts that are in your mind. I'm wondering if the thought that came to your mind is, moment. This perfectly describes the last week I just had. This is my life. Is that what you said? Or you like, oh, I'm so thrilled I came to church today because she's talking about me. God's already talking to me. I'm already experiencing God meeting me right where I am. <laughs> okay, laughter. Not so much what came to your mind. Here's what's so beautiful. Is that today we're going to have the opportunity to see that this actually is the perfect picture of our everyday life. We're going to walk through this together and we're going to see the conduct of all of this. But more importantly, we're going to see the root issue that led to that conduct. And how the gospel, the good news of Jesus, speaks to those roots so that they can be healed. That's what's so beautiful in these passages. God is showing us in these passages something deeper than mere conduct. He's showing us the roots underneath their reactions. Because that is what God is And now we're going to hear, in addition to seeing more clearly this magnifying lens of what's happening under the waters and the surface of their souls. We're going to hear what it's like for us to hear Jesus in his tender, loving voice, in his good deeds, our heart, and our circumstance, speak to the roots of the waters and meet the surface of our souls. But here's what we're going to see. God is showing us this because if we can't see the root, then we can't see our need. And He wants to meet our need. We don't need a behavior change. We are all very clear that that has never set us free. We don't need a behavior change because we need a Savior. We need rescue in our lives. That is what we all come in knowing today. Let me pray for us. Come Holy Spirit. God, I thank you that you have made us to walk with you and talk with you. And I thank you, God, for how you open our eyes as we get to know the truth of who you really are, the creator of the universe, who came to make it so clear that you love your children and that you came to be with us so that there could be victory in the roots and the struggles of our lives. You came so that you can provide victory. In the wilderness of our souls, you came so that forever we would always have a way of receiving the unconditional love that we want. Thank you. Thank you, God, that right now that you are here. Lord, you say that you've given us, you, that your sheep, you call us your sheep, your sheep hear your voice. So God, I ask that you would open our ears to hear your voice. And I ask Jesus that by your power, God, that you would bring fresh revelation now of who you are and what you have for us, God, in the salvation and the rescue of our souls. Have your way in this place, God, as it is in heaven. I ask now, God, that you would rest my 
on everyone's claims and reveal exactly what it is that you're tending to do in our hearts. And Lord, I ask for faith. I ask God that you give us faith. To believe and know that you are who you say you are. And that you are our redeemer. In Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to start and we're going to see. What was the first moment of conduct that Paul is saying that he was opposing? Conduct that was not in step with the truth of the gospel. We see it in verse 12. It says, we're seeing something happen before, and then there was a change with Peter. He says, before certain men came from James, Peter, he was eating with the Gentiles. Now, this is significant. Because as he sat on that table, across from those who once would have been seen as unclean, according to Mosaic law. He sat at that table declaring that they were equals because we can't make ourselves clean, only Jesus cleanses us. And so in that moment, he was declaring the truth of the gospel, eating, having his fill with friends. This is of great significance. It says that before he was there, he was eating. With them, but when they came, the circumcision group that we just talked about, what did he do? He drew back and he separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. So Peter was walking in the good news of the gospel. This pressure group comes and he reacted. He reacted so very quickly, just a moment. We're going to take a magnifying lens and we're going to look deeper at what's happening in a very quick moment. They could have had ramifications for the future of the church, for God's bond. Not only did he draw back, he separated themselves. So we see here that there is conduct that's happening, but we're seeing that he's reacting to something. There's something he's responding to. So what was going on underneath the surface? What's happening here? Well, we see it in verse 12. We see the root I was talking about earlier. It says in verse 12, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision part. So we see this pressure group comes along, and what's happening? Fear. Fear is there. What happens when fear speaks? What happens? When we listen to it, what happens when we respond to it? We see some of that in this picture of what's happening. It raises up a very, very, very essential question. It raises up a thought and a question that we have, which is maybe God won't give me money. And the fear, that's the question that comes up. And an even deeper, more painful question is does he love me? Does God, does Jesus really love me? Does he see me? Can I really trust him? These are questions we have. That's what's happening in the water of our souls, and that's what's happening here with Peter. It's fear. He was fearing what could happen. And so he took action. In response to that. And this is so huge. Because our inability to believe in God's love for us, that impacts his whispering to us every day of our lives when he's saying, I love you. I love you. I love you. Throughout our day, what we can have a tendency to do is to dismiss that place all the time. We can hear it and we can say, oh, it's just in my mind. I have this sense maybe God is out of it. And I want to ask you, a friend asked me recently about that, and she said, how often can you say to yourself in full confidence, I'm loved, I know it. I know God loves me. Does that come really easily for you? 
Is that an ability that you have to walk in full confidence in daily? I mean, what happens when someone confirms us and speaks the truth about us? What do we do? Do you go, oh, yeah, it's not. Is that familiar? I mean, it's surely familiar if somebody says it in front of somebody else. Oh, why do we do that? This is so important because it's as we recognize his love for us and him speaking and ministering his love to us that we see who he is. And we see rightly who we are. This is what Peter was forgetting in that moment as he was sitting, but not just sitting, he was running away. And when fear is speaking to us and we're struggling in our belief and asking the question, I don't know if God loves me. And then experiencing a wrestling of, I don't even feel loved by the people around me right now. In those moments, it's so easy to dismiss and discount the voice that we really need to speak to our soul. The only voice that speaks to fear so that it shuts up is the voice of God. That is what we need. And that's what we hear Peter right now saying. Don't do this. Don't. Turn away. We don't want to. He's saying, don't step away from his love for you. When God speaks, there's evidence. It makes me think of my friend recently who came to our Holy Spirit night. We're having our next one next Thursday. And God's Spirit was with her, and he met her. And I asked her the next day what that was like. What would she, how would she describe God meeting her? And she said, I just, it felt like space right here. I'm like, yeah, I know that. <laughs> and she was like, I just, I just didn't, I just felt like the chasing stopped. Mm. Like, I just didn't have to chase anymore. We're all tired of it. And at the root of reactivity, we're exhausting ourselves from fear. And when we say, I don't know if you really give me what I need. We're expressing also what we need to express, which is the truth of that exhaustion. When we're asking that, we're asking if he's real, if he loves us, and here is what the tenor and the tone of the sound of his voice sounds like when he comes. And when he meets us in his compassion by his gospel good news, he says, Hey, I'll give you what you need. As we experience his compassion, we start to identify he does have what he really needs. And he's not the kind of person that's ever going to give up that. But he just wants to just give it out and give it out, give it out, give it out. This is the process of walking in the spirit day by day. It's having him speak to the roots of our souls. And this is how it happens. We notice. We notice what's going on there. When emotions are coming up for us. We don't get to see that with Peter. We don't get to see that Peter said, whoa, what's happening? God, what are you saying to me right now? I had an experience recently where I was in a conversation with some friends and I noticed uh, some things that were coming up for me. And God just helped me. I just noticed my shoulders were tense, I felt like I was going to cry, and I don't know that I've done this before, but I just went to the bathroom, and I just opened up my hands, and that's all I said to them. I knew there was something going on for me, the water's going to but I couldn't identify what that was, and I needed to get back to the conversation. So this is what it looked like for me to be walked with Him holding my hand, walking by the Spirit holding my hand and providing for me. So I needed to step away, and I needed to be honest. And I just said, God, my shoulder was tense. I felt him cry. And there was evidence. I felt a, a peace, and my shoulders dropped. And I was able to then go back into that conversation. This is what it is to walk in the Spirit, to go to our Heavenly Father who knows who he has. He knows where to do. I'm in a, a master's program for marriage and family therapy. I love to study from psychology and to see all these beautiful things with Andrew. And a few weeks ago, somebody, you know, I'm very puffed up thinking, I know myself, I'm very self-reflective. 
And I was sitting with a friend who prayed for me a few weeks ago, and the Lord told her what was going on in my soul, and I just wept. I'm like, God, only you know. Only you know. The Bible says he has searched us. He knows us. He perceives our thoughts from afar. Mm. When Peter was at that table in that moment, he was at a table of freedom. He was at a table of abundance that God had sent for him. The table where he could eat and really be satisfied. It was so quickly fear spoke, so quickly fear. And this is what happens in the world at that moment in this world was. And God helps us to be honest. This is what he has for us. He wants to meet us with compassion. He wants to help us see the truth of that moment. What would have been for Peter to be like, oh, thinking God, I'm not saying the truth, I'm not remembering. And then he converts us. And even in his convicting, his voice is to bring us closer into fuller fellowship and relationship with him and learn to restore us to his living plans and purposes, not to harm us. The next conduct that Paul calls out that he's opposing, he says in verse 13, the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. Even Barnabas, tender, sweet Barnabas, who just love people. <laughs> so that's what's happening. And what's happening under hypocrisy? What's the root there? The root of the hypocrisy is the belief that we're accepted and loved by what we do. But we don't know nothing about that. I'm joking. The real energy of hypocrisy is that we believe we're accepting love based on our performance. So it's all about wearing a mask. It's always about keeping on a mask for whatever thought we've made up in our minds will equal us experiencing approval. And hypocrisy leads to insecurity. It only leads to insecurity because we never know where we're standing. God. We never know where we stand with other people. We never know where we stand with ourselves because we're always trying and working so hard and it's lonely. Because we can never let anybody look in and see who we really are. Because we're working so hard. We can't see the truth. We can't live by the truth that we're already accepted. That we're already adopted as his daughter, as his son, and we're heirs of Jesus. And what happens in this belief is that we start to see some that are better, and we start to see some that are worse. If we live our lives in a performance-based mentality, this is what is going to happen. We are always going to set each other up because we're always going to need to be the best. That is what feeds our idol. This is superiority. And insecurity, combined with superiority, leads us to see other people as enemies. And that's what's going on here with Peter. Why? Why would this person who's risking his life for Jesus, why would he step away from this tree? This good news. Jesus loves you. You can't do anything to earn that. That's just amazing. He's supposed to be with you all the time. And just be you your community. And more than you can ask or imagine, Peter. Maybe there was a soul by his favor that he was sitting across the table from him and he said he couldn't just see one. As I mentioned earlier, what was going on with me that day where I pulled away with that from the Lord to be with me, I wanted to continue to process that with him. And so I was talking to him one day and I said, and here's the thing, I was talking to him out loud and I was waiting on a response. That's how we talk to him, that's how we're made to talk to him. He's a real person who's good and wants to have a relationship with us. Talk to us. And as I was thinking of this, I was noticing kind of what was coming up with me, and I was thinking of my long history of needing to be right. The struggle, this defense that can come up with me because I want to be right. And just in that word, that moment, the words came to me to ask, why? Why do I need to be right? And just that moment, the words came because I want to matter. You know, there's this, my, uh, my reactivity is if I be right, and what's that going to do in my relationships? It hasn't been helpful at all when I forget that I'm not to God. So I was able to say, you know, if I'm seeing here, but I'm believing I don't matter to you. 
And that was the root of my real need that he was revealing. When he says, hey, I'll give you what you really need. You've forgotten that you matter. And that you don't need to work to earn your love. And that's what God says to us when we're acting in this performance-based mentality that we need to earn his love and we wear a mask and we work and we try. And he says, hey, I don't change my mind about you. Yes. He says, I don't lie. I don't change. I'm not being consistent. We see that in Peter. We see the changing. We see the inconsistency. And that's the reactivity. But God says, I come to the root and I remind you. It's Cynthia. I don't change my mind about you. The next thing Paul addresses is in verse 14. He says, when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to see this before them all. If you, a Jew, live like a Gentile, not like a Jew, how can you force, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? Here we see that forcing comes out of a combination of two things we've already worked on. It's a combination of living in fear, and it's a combination of living in a constant wearing of a mask. Never knowing where you stand with God, always trying and trying and trying. And what that leads to is anger. Deep anger. Because of the misery of our own pain. And God says, I know this is your reality. I don't care about the circumcision, outward circumcision. I care about the circumcision of your heart. Because what I have for you is intimacy. I have to come to the intimate places of your heart and help you know that you can my counselor told me that when she lays in bed every morning, she purposely does this with her son. She wants to start the day with him, for him, right by his side, because she wants him to experience her affectionate eyes. And she wants him to move out to the day, to the world, in that secure country. And she asked me to try this out with God in the mornings. In the first morning, imagining God's affection and eyes looking at me, I just, just, there can be a fear around deep intimacy, of really being seen, of really being known. What would it be like for God, the creator of the universe, to stare deep into your eyes and to tell you that you're loved? What would it be like to experience healing in his gaze? As we see Peter and Barnabas at the table, the table of abundance, we see that that is our starting place every day. That is our starting place. God says, I will prepare a table for you in the Psalms. He says, I will anoint your head with oil and your cups will overflow. Why? Because he wants to fill it. As my friend said to me recently, this is the gift Yahweh has. He helps us to come and bring our whole self, our true self, our honest self. And that is where he meets us in his compassion and he unlocks his word to us and he says, hey, I'll give you what you really need. I will. I haven't changed my mind about me. And I'm never going to be strong because I'm a force. I can. There's so many voices, so many voices that we can listen to. But the song says those who listen carefully to the Lord will testify to the truth. That's not happened with Peter. Peter listened to fear and he testified to it as truth and he followed it. And that's what led him to abandon the table of abundance that God asked for him. And God in his hands 
When we step away from the table, he's sitting there and he's patting our seat and he's saying, Come sit. your seat. Come sit. You belong here. You belong. I know you're not scared. I know you're not afraid. So, like Peter and like Barnabas, we have to ask ourselves who do we want to listen to? What can we get in the way of the news and speaking to the deepest places of our soul? He wants to help us discern his voice, and he will. So I want to encourage you to be honest. I want to encourage you to receive the gift that he will help you to tell him about where you are. You don't want to rush past what's going on and how you feel. He doesn't do that. He doesn't need you to. He just wants to be a human. And he says, what's true here? What am I believing is true? What am I believing is not true? We saw what God's word says. And then we resist the enemy who wants to harass us just like that circumstance we saw. Wants to harass, wants to steal the joy that God has for us. Wants to twist things. Notice it. And say, no, this is not what God has for me. And know that you're not meant to be alone in this. And right now, I just want you to invite you just to close your eyes and be where you are as the band comes back up. I just want to ask now for God's Spirit to rest on you. Just like I drew away in that moment to the bathroom with the Lord, because He's revealed that He's the one who will give me what I need. I want you just right where you are to ask Him. Okay, close your eyes. Just ask Him. God, how do you want me to be in your love right now? What is it that you want to say? What is it that you want to reveal to me? You may notice just a sense of peace, a calm. You may experience God's words speaking to you. Maybe one more. Maybe it's I love you, but this time you're not missing something. You may to hear the seven words. And I just thank you, God. I just pray for you all now. I just thank you, God, that as anxiety comes and the alarm bell is striking us, you come and you need us to restore us. So, God, I thank you now for what you want to restore. And us. So that we can be here with the experience of deliverance. So I just want to invite everybody to stand.